we are doing a 360 degrees uh, filming today, so uh, feel free uh, to uh, entertain yourself as well. <laughs> okay, we can start, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Tian Wei, I'm moderator and host coming from CCTV News. And it's a great pleasure for me to be the one who leads with questions with a conversation with one of the most established NBA players, Jeremy Lin. Thank you. I love the hairstyle, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> and Thank the you. earrings. I appreciate it. I just told, told her backstage, uh, my, my parents aren't big fans, but uh, <laughs> I feel like at this age, you know, might as well get it all out of my system. And when I have kids and stuff, I won't yeah. be doing all this. I mean, you're in China, so feel free to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you are a bit not used to people just shape you as a Chinese-American basketball player. And yet, every time you are approached by the press, you have been asked questions, including now, about that. So what do you feel about your identity? Let's just begin with a very serious note. Okay, um, I'll do my best. I know there's people behind me. Um, we do my best to look at you guys, but um, yeah, I think for me, when I first started um, at Harvard, uh, obviously every question was just like, man, you're, you're Asian, what, what is, what's that like? Um, what's it like to be Asian? I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know, Asian probably the same. Here. You know, it's no different than you being whatever ethnicity you are, um, but that's all anybody wanted to talk about. And uh, I felt like, I felt like everybody kind of just put me into, oh my goodness, he's, uh, he's Asian, he's Asian. And I, and I remember just kind of thinking to myself, there's this whole other side of, you know, it kind of opened my eyes to what life was like in the U.S. because I was playing basketball at a, at a high level, but it didn't seem like people were willing to talk about that as much as they were just, hey, you're, you know, you're Asian American. Um, and so I think for me, slowly as I got older, I kind of just learned to appreciate my identity in terms of who I am for myself versus allowing what other people think of me to kind of shape who I am. And um, a lot of that goes back to my faith. Um, I'm a Christian, so mm -hmm. I, always kind of, I always kind of talk about my identity comes first and foremost from Christ. But it's a double sword, isn't it? On the one hand, you've got so much respect, particularly on this Asian continent. Yeah. The first Chinese American made it so high to the NBA and also certainly have that straight seven games, really impressive. On the other hand, you're being shaped by this identity. Yeah. So how can you break it? Um, Do you want to break it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think a double-edged sword is a great way to say it. If I score 20 points, everyone's like, he's the greatest. And if I score five, they're like, he's the worst, right? And so what you see in my, the way I'm viewed now is a very, um, it's very bipolar. Um, you're either like, you think I'm the best or you think I'm the worst. And that's just what I've seen in a lot of fans. And uh, I think for me now, I just try to be more proactive about um, like controlling my brand. Mm -hmm. um, and so the things that I want to be known for or what, what do I want my legacy to be, um, you know, things like that. I try to be more proactive versus letting everybody else kind of dictate what they feel about me. Because um, obviously in today's day and age, what they feel about you is basically what you did your last game. Um, that's, that's kind of how, how things work and um, that's how people are judged. And so I just try to be a little bit more proactive about um, shaping who I feel like I want to be known as. I, was, I remember reading some materials related to what your friend said about you. Um, in one media report, they were suggesting people want to come up to you and take photos with you. But when they walk to the door of the mall, they're saying how much you suck yeah. in the recent games. Of course, not the people sitting here. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the price you pay as a celebrity, right? Yeah. I know you were having a little bit difficulty adjusting to that, but you eventually came out of it. Does computer games help? <laughs> yeah, uh, computer games definitely helps, um, you know, because for me that helps me reset mentally um, when I'm feeling stressed. Which game is that? I play Dota 2. Oh, that's uh, fun. So I play with my, uh, the good thing is I get to play with people across the world. Like when I was playing in Charlotte and my little brother was playing in Taiwan, we could still play online together. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, yeah, it was, uh, at first I felt like I lost my privacy um, when everything happened. Everywhere I went, people wanted a, you know, a picture or a whatever, um, a video or an autograph. And then at first I got really upset, but then 
Um, and I felt like, man, like I'm just kind of like a zoo animal, you know, like people just kind of stop by, <laughs> take a picture, and then they kind of go on their way. I felt like a, you know, I, I would always say like I'm a, I'm a zoo animal. You're um, not. Thank You're you. You're our hero. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, but I think as I got older, I really appreciated or embraced the platform that comes with it. Mm. Um, like I have a voice. I'm 27 years old. I'm able to attend the World Economics Forum, like something that um, is just, you know, a tremendous honor. Um, I'm able to impart my values or what I feel like is important and be able to try to impact this world. Um, and these are the things that I focus on whenever I start feeling like a zoo animal. But, but, um, but how much time that. you have to personally use and oh. intellect you have to personally use in order to adjust yourself on issues like this? A lot. Um, I mean, I'm kind of dumb. I use a lot of time, even though <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a very small potato from China, but still. So what does it mean for you? Um, I mean, I think a big part of that is um, surrounding myself with the right people. Because you know, my, my main job is, is basketball. So right. I train every day. Um, I, I, during the season, I, I barely have any time. But if I surround myself with the right people, um, I think that's, that's what it's about. So my agencies, my, um, the people who work for me, we talk about a plan. We have retreats every year. We say, all right, this is certain situations um, or directions that we want to go in. This is how we want to change and shape the world or whatever. And they start game planning for things that will allow me or give me those opportunities. During the summer, like right now, I have the chance to be able to do something like this. Um, but if there's no strategy ahead of time, that's kind of what I meant by being proactive, is there's no, if there's no strategy, then I'm kind of just being tossed back and forth, going with the flow, reacting to everything, um, mm -hmm. versus kind of playing offense. So what it. is your strategy now? Uh, my strategy, uh, honestly, a big part of what I want to do is, I mean, I can't really answer it in, in a short thing because there's so many things We've I want to do. We've got time. We've got time. But if I could, if I could summarize, um, definitely I want to, I want to be, uh, bring Christ to a lot of different areas in the world that um, I feel like uh, don't, um, don't have that um, access to just understand what that's about. I think um, underprivileged children um, are something that's very near and dear to me. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up with a lot of teammates who, um, their parents never drove them to games. Some of them didn't have parents. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't sleep well at night because they were gunshots. Um, I would talk to them, hey, what college are you going to or what college do you want to go to? And they they were, they kind of laughed. They're like, college? Are you kidding me? And um, so underprivileged children has always been something that once I saw how my teammates grew up, you know, I felt like, hey, if I have a chance, I'm going to do something about that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, basketball as well. Um, I want to grow the basketball, especially here. Um, growing up in the U.S., we're so spoiled. We have access to the best coaching and everything. Um, and then education. Earlier this morning, I was at a box fish thing. Um, it's, it's an ed tech app. And it's, uh, it's providing English to like 8,000 schools right now for free. And mm -hmm. um, it integrates games into education. And it just makes it engaging for the students. And so we want to we branch out and touch a, doc, a lot of different areas. But I would say those are probably the top four. Hmm. Talking about bring basketball to this part of the world, uh, we've seen a lot of great players from China. But not many have been making themselves to the NBA. Earlier, we got Yao Ming. I know. You were also commenting on Yao Ming when he whose name is in the Hall of Fame for the basketball. Uh, very gracious of you to do that. Um, what do you make of the level of playing for the Chinese ball basketball players these days? Of course, except Yao Ming, he's already there. Right. The others. Um, well, I think it's, it's slowly it's getting better. Um, if you look at the CBA, you see a lot of American coaches, European coaches um, coming in. I think you see. A lot of former NBA players or uh, fringe NBA players, Stephon Marbury and Jordan Crawford, Greg Oden, mm -hmm. uh, Michael Beasley was here. You see a lot of big time players. And, and what that does, is it just raises the level of, of basketball competition. And kids are only going to get better and better. Um, I think uh, you know, we, we had two, two Chinese players get drafted, which is awesome. You know, obviously, I hope they make it with the second round. It's, it's going to be difficult, but mm -hmm. I hope they make it and stick. And uh, my dream is when I'm, when I'm old and, and have gray hair and everything, I want to be able to look at the NBA and just see a bunch of Asians. Like, it, I want to see the Asians like we see European players in the NBA. I think that would be an just awesome Just a bunch thing. of them, you mean? A bunch of them, yeah. Just a bunch of them? Uh, <laughs> I mean, we can get greedy and, and try to take over the whole thing. Well, of course, but, uh, today we've already got the news, Jerry, as you know. We were talking about this before coming in here. Uh, Zhou Qi, coming from uh, Xinjiang, yeah. uh, was uh, drafted uh, by the uh, Houston Rockets. 
And of course, they got more rounds to compete in order for that the most important position. But that reminds me of your story. I mean, you've been sitting on the benches for a long time before. <laughs> One critical moment when there were no other players to call on, the coach made you up there in the court, and eventually the story happened. What do you make of this? Is this a coincidence, or is it hard work of years? Um, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a combination, right? I think if we all think about our own lives, um, you guys are all sitting here today. I mean, I think you guys would say you took advantage of the opportunities you had, but there are a lot of other things that had to happen along the way. And that's kind of how I, I think about Linsanity. Um, it was a perfect storm of a lot of different things. Um, you know, playing for D'Antoni and guys getting hurt, being in the biggest market. Um, we had our two best players get hurt at that time and um, everything kind of came together. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously I had to work hard and try to hone my craft, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it, not to be like pessimistic, but if you, you're asking me what's, you know, what do I make of it or what's the one thing I, I, I think of it is, uh, honestly, I, I remember how fleeting that moment of success was, you know? Tell us. Um, I will. Uh, <laughs> I like, I remember I was just like, I was just like, so I was happy, but then like two, three weeks later, I was kind of like, man, all I'm thinking about is the next game because if I don't play well, then there's backlash, and then after I play well, then I have to play well the next game, and after the season, it's the next season. And that's when I kind of like had an epiphany moment where it was like, all right, well, if being on top of the world isn't good enough, then what is? Um, and I think that's when I started to kind of take uh, another step spiritually um, and just help to really enjoy the moment, enjoy each day. And I think now, as I go through my life, um, like this past season, with the Hornets, I, that was my most enjoyable season. It wasn't my best statistical season um, or anything like that, but I appreciated each little moment. I appreciated the bus rides. I appreciated you know, some nights where it's just like, man, my body's hurting. I, I had to play four games in five nights, mm -hmm. but learning to appreciate the grind of your job mm -hmm. um, and uh, to appreciate the fact that I'm, I'm competing against the best in the world, like things like that. Um, before, I, I didn't, I was too, I was just too focused on the next thing to really appreciate what I had now. Um, and and that's, you know, that's probably the one thing I, I learned the most. Mm. And you moved, of course, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Yeah. Does that help? That definitely you were helps. Born, right. That definitely in, helps. I'm a California guy. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. You know, In-N-Out Burger, anybody here likes In-N-Out Burger? Um, <laughs> I'm a California guy and, uh, you know, and um, so every, every off season I spend my time in California. Yeah. How do you relax yourself? Earlier we talked about computer games, but I heard in your two-room apartment, I even know that, <laughs> yeah, how do you uh, there was a stack of shoes uh, <laughs> <laughs> occupying the whole one wall. Is that true? Um, Let me I know if there was too much uh, privacy being revealed. I do have a shoe wall. Um, wow. <laughs> so I'm, uh, you know, I have a five-year endorsement deal with Adidas, and they treat me a, a little bit uh, you know, they, they spoil me. They spoil you. There's yeah. no other way to say it. They spoil me. So um, I literally had to call Adidas and tell them, hey, um, you need to stop sending shoes. I, I, have, no, <laughs> I have no more You have room. to get me a party. I've given away shoes. A, hundreds of pairs of Adidas <laughs> shoes. Um, but the ones I like, I keep. And uh, I've created a, I basically went to Ikea, bought a bunch of little mini, sh you know, shoe, sh shoe racks. And then I glued them all together to make a big wall. And then after I got to, you know, my wall has, has 108 pairs, and I told myself um, I cannot make my wall any bigger. So are, now, are you gonna wear them one by one? Honestly, I, I try to give away. I gave away the like <laughs> I gave away like 50 pairs last year. Just anybody who's my size. The problem is uh, most of my Asian friends <laughs> don't wear size 12, <laughs> and most of my non-Asian friends are larger than size 12. So uh, I usually end up with a you know a stockpile of shoes. Talk there. in between. Yeah. The sizes. Exactly. And the races. Yeah. Sometimes. If I could quote you um, a little bit, you were saying back in the year 2012 at the All Star Weekend interview, something like this. I know a lot of people say I'm deceptively athletic and deceptively quick, and I'm not sure what deceptive is. You said, but it could be the fact that I'm an Asian American, but I think that's fine. It's something that I embrace and it gives me a chip on my shoulder. But I'm very proud to be an Asian American and I really 
I love it. Um, having said that, though, I know there were some kinds of um, debates, uh, if not the exchange of harsh words, uh, between you and some of the other players. Um, but when Kobe Bryant retired, you said something very graciously about him. And you were quoted widely about that. Help us to understand what is it like to be with different kinds of players, to understand them, to have the empathy, and also to grow yourself out yeah. of those interactions? Yeah, it's a, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I feel like one of the most valuable things, I actually learned this from my high school coach, one of the most valuable things, and if you ask me why is my high school coach such a great coach, it's because, um, it's because he, uh, he never thought he knew it all. Um, and, and I remember we played a team, and we, they took us to overtime, and we barely beat them, but they were uh, definitely less talented. And after my coach called that coach and said, hey, what, is, you know, what was it about your team that made it so difficult for us? Um, and I was just like, man, that's like... Uh, I could learn from that, you know? And, and so as I've gone through my experiences with so many different players, um, I just try to pick up one or two things from everybody. Um, if I could just steal one or two things, um, you know, from Kobe, I just saw how detailed he was, um, his footwork, uh, you know, things like that. Like, I normally don't think that much about my footwork. Um, I'm, no, I'm pretty fast, so I just, there's not much footwork. You just run in a straight line, you go by <laughs> people. Um, that's like how I try to play. But for him, there's so much angles, there's so, there's so much change of pace. Um, and so, you know, learning how he thought about the game was something that I appreciated. And so when he retired, um, I definitely had, um, you know, some nice words to say. And What and did I you think, say about him, just to remind our audience? Oh, I just said congrats on the 60 piece, um, which he scored 60 in his last game. And I said it's a fitting way for, for an amazing career. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, I just, try to learn, I just try to learn everywhere I go. And, and uh, I think that's really important uh, for anybody. And uh, so... You know, and another thing I try to do is I try to put myself in someone else's shoes as much as I can because um, obviously we all go through situations where we feel like this isn't fair, that isn't fair. Um, and I think it happens every day, but usually when I take the time to really talk to somebody or like explain or see where they're coming from, I, I often take a softer stance um, from my perspective. I'm like, wow, I can actually understand that. So I see a lot of other players. I see what happens to me. Sometimes I don't think things are fair. And uh, I just kind of try to roll with the punches the best I can. And, but and, and, but uh, you know, Jeremy, does humility help, uh, humility help, really? I mean, uh, this is a very competitive sport yeah. we're talking about. And people just go very expressive, and even yeah. in order to attract the media spotlight. Yeah. So uh, does it really help to um, be the I, modest and, one? And I asked myself that question for years. Um, I said... Did you resolve it? Did I right, ask I, the right I, questions? I think, <laughs> I think so. If you asked me three years ago, I don't think I would have an answer for you. Um, but I always thought to myself, you know, humility, obviously, uh, the, the Bible talks about how humility is, is, is uh, true greatness. And, it, you know, for me, I always felt like it's a form of strength. And then I started to play in the NBA. And I was like, look, the best players are very arrogant. Um, they, they're arrogant and they think they're the best. And that's why they are the best. And... And so I started to struggle with this whole concept, and I started to ask myself a lot of questions. Um, but I think humility is a strength, because if you look at this past year, um, why did we, as the Hornets, why, why did we exceed expectations? We were expected to finish 13th in the Eastern Conference. We finished sixth, and we were you know, a half game out from finishing third. Mm -hmm. It's because we had humility on that team. We were willing to sacrifice. We were willing to play for each other. Um, I think if you look at teams that overachieve, a big part is they're very humble in the way they go about stuff. I think there's a big difference between being humble and being stepped on. Um, and I think that's where I kind of learned to pick up the difference. When I step on the court, um, for lack of a better analogy, um, you know, we always talk about stepping on people's throats. That's the analogy that you think of when you play because you, you have to. You can't play, you can't play with, a, with a, you know, a passive, you know, I hope I, you know, it has to be a, 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 you know, an enforcing type of attitude. But I still think you can do that in a humble way. A great example to me is Steph Curry, Tony Dungy. Mm -hmm. These are guys, Tony Dungy was a, a coach who won the Super Bowl, and his rule, his rule was, I'll never yell or cuss at my players. So he never yelled, he never cussed at his players, wow. but he earned their respect, and they were running, willing to run through a brick wall for them because of the way he approached it. But that didn't mean that he didn't have the 
he didn't command the respect of his locker room, that didn't mean players didn't get punished. Same with Steph, if you look at his demeanor, he smiles, he jokes, he dances, he has a lot of fun, but when he steps on the court, he's going for blood. And, uh, but the way he carries his, his, himself is, is with a very humble demeanor, the way he treats people. Um, if you talk to him, like I talk to him now, and there's no difference than when I was his teammate. Um, you know, and I, to me, that's humility, and, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's very admirable. That is so beautiful, I have to say. Oh. Right, ladies and gentlemen? We, I think we need to give him a few <laughs> round of applause for that. <laughs> beautiful what you said. Okay. It's not just on the basketball court, it's everywhere. Yeah. What you have just said. <laughs> yes. Having said that, though, I have to go one step further. Sure. Um, talking about your professional career, you go free agent now. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What is the rationale behind it? Um, I mean, for me, I want to find a home. Um, I've played six years in the NBA. I've played on five different teams, and I've played for two D-League teams. So seven cities in six years. Um, I'm tired of boxes. I'm mm. tired of moving companies, and, uh, and I want to find a home. And, and the shoes? Yeah, <laughs> the shoe wall is the hardest thing to move. I'm not oh, gonna yeah. lie. You yeah. gotta you gotta wrap all. It's it's yeah. it's complicated. Um, but uh, yeah, I think for me, I want to find a home, and I want to. And I think if you ask me, like, what what do you want out of free agency? Um, I want to see how good I can become. I'm 27, and an athlete's prime, or at least in the NBA, your prime is usually 20, 27 to 30. Um, that's when you kind of peak. Um, physically, mentally, um, and, and that's where most players perform their best. And so I'm going into my prime, and uh, I want to see how great I can be as a player, and, and that's my purpose in free agency. So um, I'll just exhaust every opportunity to see uh, which one will be the best for me. Yeah, what kind of opportunities are you talking about? Um, Let's go into details. That's, <laughs> now that's where I can't go into details um, because uh, it's actually illegal for us to talk to teams until July 1st. At this moment, so. may I raise a detail because a lot of friends in New York are asking me to ask the question to you. Sure. Jeremy, come back to New York. Is that a possibility? Um, it's not looking likely because they just traded for Derrick Rose. <laughs> um, but uh, I will say ever since I left, I've always been open to going back. Um, I've all, and I still am, uh, you know, never say never. That's one thing in the NBA, never say never. Um, and so I've always been open, but, um, it, you know, right now, I don't, I'm not sure if it's the best timing, but uh, if it happens, it happens. You come to China once every year almost. Um, I'm sure there are different kinds of off-the-record discussions about what kind of cooperation could happen, how much nurture you give to the young players in China, and what kinds of uh, future initiative there could be, even between China and the United States. So um, what areas do you think that China can work on more in order to raise the level of the basketball? You know, we have a joke here. Anything that's with a fence, Chinese do really well. For example, tennis, uh, table tennis, badminton. Gotcha. Uh, but when it comes to the free court, uh, soccer or basketball, there might be some challenges. Yeah. So any advice? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely in, uh, I have these conversations. Uh, I think by the way, I'm it. doing stereotyping, so it's not politically correct, but yeah. just a joke to throw around. No, 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 I, I totally understand. Um, and I think, uh, see, I'm lucky. Um, the reason why I say that is, uh, you know, I, I try to learn from the players who come before me, and I think Yao is a great player. Um, and I just had dinner with him in Shanghai, and um, he's treated me so well ever since I came into the league. And uh, what I see him doing now, I just try to, I just try to learn and kind of like plot because eventually I'm going to retire too. And and so what Yao's been doing, he's been doing a lot of stuff. He has a team. He, you know, he works with the Shanghai Sharks, and um, he works with you know basketball and trying to change basketball in, in China and. If you ask me what's the one thing, um, I think right now when we see a lot of Chinese players go over to the U.S., they're, they're mostly seven-footers or above. And I think developing um, players, not just based on their height, but based on, you know, I think that's why Steph Curry is so great for the game, is he's this 6'3", he's not that strong, he doesn't jump that high, he's not extremely quick, he's not mm -hmm. a freak of nature athletically, he's just skilled. If we can make the Chinese basketball players skilled, if we can teach them these things, they don't have to be seven feet, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because there's a time and place for centers, but if we can just make it more well-rounded, I think um, we'll see a lot more guards, Asian guards yes. in the NBA. And um, there's, you know, there's a lot of other things, too, that, um, you know, like every country, we can all improve on. And, and one thing that you know, kind of breaks my heart is seeing former players 
when they retire, where are they at in their lives? What are their opportunities, job opportunities? What's their education um, level? And so um, I think that pushing the concept of student athlete is really, really important. Um, if I get hurt tomorrow and can never play the game again, at least I have a degree. I can go do something with it. Um, there's, there's uh, you know, people, the people around me have, you know, helped so that I can transition into something else because eventually I'm going to stop playing. Mm. And, uh, you know, I think that's definitely something important for, for uh, some of the players that we have in, in China as well. Before we wrap up, we've only got three minutes left. Oh, two minutes only. Hmm. Okay. You have to be very skillful in answering two questions within two minutes. Okay. Without wasting any time. So let me ask you directly. Okay. There has been a lot of reporting about corruptions, about the sports system. We've heard scandals about FIFA. We've heard scandals about IOC. As a sportsman yourself, what do you make of all of this? And also, what can you do? Um, Decency yeah. of the sport. Yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, if you ask me what I can do, I can't really do it much. Um, and that's kind of what is annoying. Um, because, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a problem solver, so when I see a problem, I want to help it. Um, but I think uh, one thing I want to do is eventually be in a position where I can do something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so what that requires now is learning, talking to people, uh, meeting people, and uh, just, you know, trying to learn as much as I can. Obviously, it's, it's disappointing, but, um, you know, you see a lot of cheating allegations and stuff like that. But I think, I think we're headed in the right direction. I think we're cleaning up sports in general. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, one day I want to be able to when I can't play the game anymore, I want to still be able to affect the game. And that's a great way to do it at a high level. Yeah, and final question. What specific skills are you working on these days? <laughs> I'm working on my shooting. Um, OK. And I see everyone laughs. Elaborate then, on uh, that. <laughs> I'm just trying to be a great shooter. It because, seems that uh, you are working on the same thing as we do, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to be a great shooter because um, I can really drive to the basket. And that's kind of um, why everyone um, that, that's basically why I can play in the NBA is because I can drive. But if I feel like if I can shoot at a more consistent and, um, and if I can hit more types of shots, um, it'll open up my driving game. So I'm shooting like 700 to 1,000 jumpers every day while I'm not on this Asia trip. And, uh, and we're just every day just in there. We got a rebounding machine and a big, huge net. It just <laughs> fires the ball out back and forth. And we just keep shooting and it comes back out. So. Yeah. It's been, it's been a good, it's been a fun, fun offseason. It's great to have you here in Summer Davos so that you can have a rest at least. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Lin. Thank you.